Hello and welcome to Code with JV, and episode number one of the AI Snapshot. I've been spending a lot of time when I'm checking in with students just answering questions about what's happening in the world of AI, because there's a lot happening, it's super interesting, and it changes pretty fast. I figured it was worth making a dedicated video series to just share all the stuff that I'm seeing as I see it. Hit subscribe if you want to see more of them. Let's see what's happening in the world of AI. It's the end of May at the moment, and this landed about a week ago. Microsoft had their big build conference, and they had a lot of AI announcements. The big takeaway is that Windows Copilot is going to be a thing in Windows 11. So sometime this year, they'll be putting out an update where AI agents just get integrated in with Windows in a fairly big way. Their demo videos got lots of examples of like, hey, can you open apps for me? Can you play music for me? Here we got a focus timer starting up. And they've also started to look at things like drag a PDF in here and summarize it for me. So think about ChatGPT in Windows available for everyone. It's, it's, it will be as big this year as ChatGPT was last year. And if you think about how much ChatGPT has impacted the world and how fast it's moved, imagine what's going to happen when that happens in Windows. Because the other thing is, their Windows Copilot is going to be able to use all of the OpenAI plugins. So everyone who's building a plugin for ChatGPT, compatible with this. And it's going to integrate in with their full Office suite as well, worth paying attention to because this, I think, will be very impactful. This was a bit earlier in the month, but NVIDIA announced a whole bunch of research papers that they've got accepted into a conference. One of them was around training 3D models based off sports video. So you can essentially think about tennis, basketball, soccer, when all these games where the models are learning how to move and play the game by watching hours and hours of video. Interesting technology. They've got a lot of stuff like that. This one here, here's the academic title. The marketers got involved and they're calling it Perfusion. I assume it's the marketers. Maybe the academics were really creative with a name. But essentially, it is where you can have a single image as a starting point and then use text to image generators to say, hey, here's my teddy bear, put my teddy bear in a boat or running a barbecue or in a play. And they're claiming it's beating a whole bunch of the current state of the art at this task. So here is upload your cat and then say you want to see the cat in a play wearing a costume or a teddy bear playing with a ball in the water, etc. Impressive results. But also a week later, this is ControlNet, which is a stable diffusion plugin or an automatic 1111, which is a web interface to stable diffusion. So the big open text image generators. ControlNet's been around for a while where you can draw pictures of people and that means it'll, the image will show the people in that sort of shape, etc. They've released Refresh only and it does exactly the same thing. And it's out right now and you can use it. I'll share a couple of links to some people on YouTube getting very excited about it. But as you upload a single image and then you start to have the full power of the text to image model to, that incorporates that image. When I first saw the text to image stuff, one of the use cases I was really interested in was can I create superhero characters for my nieces and nephews so they don't have to, you know, live off Disney stuff? And can we make stories together? And then pretty hard with at the stage, but this stuff now you can totally make a character and then you can use that character as your reference and then put that character in any scene you can imagine. So if you think about what this enables for people who want to create comics or literature or movies or so many things out right now, you can absolutely play with it. Pretty impressive stuff. I also spent a bunch of time this week trying to get some local models going. And this repo here, Fast Chat, really good way to play with large language models on your local machine. So they've got a nice interface. You can download the model and get it going. They've been shipping a lot of stuff recently as well. This month, they released the Chatbot Arena. So you can go to their website and these are all the models that you can chat with and try them out. But the Arena Battle is where you chat with a single prompt and two models answer and you choose which one is best. So it's like a head-to-head -head competition of the different chatbots. You don't know which one is generating which text. And they have used this to build a leaderboard, which shows you how well people rate different chatbots. So GPT-4 is a clear winner. Claude by Anthropic coming in in a good second. And then you see three and a half turbo in there. And then you start to see their model. So again, they're running the competition, but they do a lot to make their methodology transparent and auditable. So there's some objectivity to this. The Vicuna model is beating up a bunch of the other ones, kind of. 
In their recent blog post, they went into a bit more analysis about what's been happening in the week four rounds. One of the takeaways was that, yes, while Palm is a few points behind Vicuna, it's the Google's proprietary model, and they've been fairly conservative with what they let it do and what they don't. So they've got examples of like, did humans land on the moon? And Palmer's like, oh, I'm not going to say, I'm just a large language model. Whereas the open models will just go and tell you what they think. When a human sees that, they'll downvote it. So short version is Palmer's probably stronger than Vicuna for most tasks that you'd think about. And one of the fascinating things as I was diving into this, so down here is Llama. I've got a hypothesis that Llama came out of a text autocorrect because I was typing LLMs on my phone the other day and it autocorrected to llamas. And I was like, did the Facebook devs have the same experience and that's why they decided to call it llama? Or was it just, you know, humans coming up with a name? But llama is the Facebook model. It was released earlier in the year, um, or rather the code was released and the weights were leaked. Everyone's got hold of it and starting to build on top of. And it's got this like non-commercial license. So pretty much when you see a non-commercial one here, that means that model was derived from llama. So Vicuna is built on top of Linus, fine-tuned using the Llama base weights. The thing about it is that it was fine-tuned using this data set from ShareGPT. I found this fascinating. So this crew have basically built a browser plugin. It snoops on your chat GPT sessions, like you install it, so you want it to, but you can save it to this collective database. Then the Vicuna folks basically use that to tweak Llama off all these, like the dregs of chat GPT. And that's what got it good enough to top the list of the open models. The one I've been playing around with most is FastChat. You'll see that these MPT and FastChat, they're the two best performing open ones with like quite permissive licenses. And it's the smallest model as well. And it's only a bit behind. So it's, you know, definitely not a chat GPT, but you can install it. You can run it. If you've got a decent graphics card, you'll get decent performance out of it. And I think there's something really interesting about when you get these models running on your local machines and you're not making API calls to get access to them, what do you do differently? The Gorilla dropped in the last couple of days and it is a fascinating language model which is built in around calling APIs. So instead of like a plugin and chat GPT where APIs are used to extend a model with wrapping stuff around it, this model has built in the ability to think about APIs, to reason about APIs. Here they've got a collab you can play with and if you look at some of their examples, it's like, I want to translate from English to Chinese. And they're starting to do things like, oh, okay, you're probably going to want to go to get this model and tweak it. And you can get from this one, you can do this. And so it's starting to have this awareness of a plan about how to achieve a task using other code, which is very different to what the language models do, where they just basically remember what based off the text they've learned and they just spit out more text. It's really early, moving pretty fast. And it's fascinating um, to see where this is going because I think this rhymes a lot with like auto GPT and the, hey, agent, go and use a large language model to make a list of things about how you're going to achieve a plan, ask your human if it's okay, and then go for it. I also saw a similar thing in the Microsoft semantic kernel where they're building a library to extend C Sharp and Python with a bunch of this stuff built into it. It's got baked into it, this idea of the planner. So you can start to say, okay, semantic kernel, I want to do this. And here's my prompt library and how I'm doing things. The kernel will start to ask LLMs to make a plan for it. It will keep track of that plan. It will execute against that plan and try and do useful things for you. There's a lot of stuff happening in this sort of agent centric space. Last one, Laura is a thing which really had a big impact on the text to image crowd with stable diffusion because people realized that they could start to just do little tweaks on models and change them for a specific task quite cheaply on consumer grade hardware. This crowd have written a paper and some demonstration code doing the same thing for a large language model. And so a 65 billion parameter model and those open models we were looking at, 13 billion, 7 billion, 3 billion. And we've seen with the proprietary models, the more parameters, the more data, their abilities increase quite quickly. If you've got a big model like this and you want to tweak it, I think they mentioned the figure like 700 gigabyte of RAM. An expensive graphics card running you a few thousand dollars will probably be about 24 gigabytes of RAM. So what they have done is they have trained this massive model in 24 hours using two consumer grade graphics cards, which puts it in the hands of researchers the world over, developers the world over. Lots of people who didn't have access to tweaking a large model 
will get it if this tech stacks up. This is where I'm seeing things going. These agent-centric AIs, the idea of people tweaking models and changing them, because if you think about many tasks you'd like to use an AI for, I think a good metaphor is like, what's something you'd hire an intern for and how would you supervise an intern? Future JV here. The thing I forgot to mention was that for a lot of tasks, you don't need your intern to be able to pass the New York bar exam or to know a bunch about the history of art or medical literature or to be able to code in every language on the planet. You don't need that breadth of skills. And that's what you get when you use the large expensive language models. They can do lots and lots of things. Instead, what you often want an intern is someone who you can talk to and have good base communication with and some skill in a particular area. So maybe they're very good at legal research or particularly good at reviewing policy or particularly good at writing code in a particular language for a particular framework, which is why I think these light models combined with the ability to train them on proprietary data, which maybe you don't want to share with you know big AI companies, is going to be game changing because a lot of government agencies and corporations are starting to look at AI and going, no, nah, we're not going to let our staff do that. Samsung recently came out and banned everyone from using ChatGPT because as soon as you do, you're leaking proprietary information or you're putting a dependency on stuff where you don't know the bias, etc. Instead, if you have a small model, which you can get for free, and you can start to train it and tweak it and supervise it internally for your particular needs, I think you'll see a ton of organizations starting to do this because the productivity gains are just so significant. So when you start to think about what AI will you download or rent or hire, and what tasks will you give them, you'll start to have options. And those options are going to be tweaked and refined a lot because of this tech that's being worked on now. In the context of Windows Copilot rolling out this year and these agents' tech starting to mature, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people are going to be starting to tackle tasks towards the mid and end of this year by, oh yeah, I'm just going to fire up an agent, see what their plan is, get them to do some work. There's a lot of things you could start to set these agents at. So that's the first episode. When I get a tab full of browsers, I'll post up the next episode. And hey, feedback's always welcome. Have fun in the meantime. Take care.